So, welcome. <laughs> so today we have the great honor and, and pleasure of hosting uh, Emmanuel Boisson uh, for the and Cecile Rousseau <laughs> for the for the keynote uh, today. Um, I, I think I think it's going to be a super interesting and really insightful talk, and, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so uh, Emmanuel has a background in in pharma, so uh, did a PhD in pharmacology in in, in France in Institut Gustave Cossé, I think, yeah. And then, well, moved to the States to do some research in the Institute of Mental Health and, and then uh, started a, a super successful career um, mixing profiles in industry and also in the regulatory space. So things like uh, FDA, EMA, etc. cetera. Uh, I was very surprised or, or, or kind of, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was really remarkable to see that she was in charge of reviewing applications, for example, in the FDA for drugs for HIV AIDS, uh, which I think is something uh, quite uh, quite impressive. And to me that I work on software and when something doesn't work, I just restart. And it, it, it looks like a lot, a lot of responsibility. Um, so now Emmanuel is working at uh, VCLS um, uh, together with Cecile. I, I'm sorry, I didn't study your background. Maybe you, you want to? Yeah, <laughs> to say, about it. Uh, sure. yeah. uh, so um, thank you. Uh, my background is I got a PhD in medical and biological engineering. I've been working in the US for cell engine therapy, biomaterial medical device therapy. And I work also in companion diagnostic and I joined Emmanuel in VCLS a few years ago and I'm in the non-clinical clinical group early development, and I'm also taking care of uh, some in silico application. Thanks very much. So I will stop because really the, the, the interesting thing is here. So <laughs> thank you, please. OK, so good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to talk about one of our favorite. Uh, when I say our, it's always Cecile and I, because the two of us are passionate about in silico medicine and, and promoting it. Um, so basically, uh, so basically, I'll skip the agenda, but uh, we're, I just wanted to let you know what we do at Voisin Consulting Life Sciences so that you understand our interest in in silico uh, and then talk a little bit in general about product development before we go um, into the more technical stuff with um, with Cécile. Um, so who we are in two words and I won't spend time on this slide but just to, t to let you know that our <coughs> DNA is really to be pioneers and to be in innovation. And this is the reason why, and we'll talk about uh, uh, a lot during this whole speech, uh, about accelerating product. I'm saying product because we can talk about medical devices and drugs and many more. And uh, so we, we want to accelerate product development. And that's really what our goal. We can achieve that in particular by being, for example, um, in working groups that create the regulations of tomorrow so that we already have in mind what the European Commission, the US Senate have in mind so that we then apply it when we are in those working groups so that the guidelines and the regulations of tomorrow become what we want them to be. And in particular, since we have our favorite little startups that we work with, um, or spin-offs, by the way. <laughs> so um, we have our favorite little ones, and they're called SME, small, medium enterprise. And sometimes the interest of these companies may not be always met and respected in, in the guidelines and regulations. So our role is really to bring them into the picture and to make sure that their interest and their possibilities, the, what, what they can do is taken into account when creating new, new regulations for um, product development. One other way of, uh, um, of um, impacting the regulations is obviously to be a member of a number of associations, such as, for example, in cell and gene therapy, the ARM, 
Um, that's one example. We also have Europa Bio, UCOP, and, and this type of associations. But most importantly, and that's where I wanted to get to, uh, most importantly, we are very active members of the Avicenna Alliance because, and I'll explain why we are interested in promoting in silico product development and making sure that the in silico is part of the whole uh, process to bring products to the market and beyond. So, um, what we do, well, this is uh, really um, um, a fast one. We are, we put at the center the regulatory science and the market access. And those two keywords, you know, regulatory and market access, access to market, are really using a lot of um, put that, well, have a lot of potential when using in silico to accelerate uh, those processes. So I just wanted to remind you that, for example, when you develop a drug, but we're going to speak about it extensively, you have CMC, chemistry, manufacturing and control. You have um, pharmacokinetics and toxicology in animals. Then you have all the clinical trials that are there to represent, uh, well, to, to demonstrate safety and efficacy in humans. So basically, well, in humans, let's talk about it. So basically, in fact, uh, what uh, we concentrate on is the existing three pillars of development, which are um, quality, safety, efficacy, and the famous fourth pillar, which is the one that will allow you to obtain a price and a reimbursement when you want to market your product. And the fourth pillar being the economic value of the product, also called health technology assessment. So now I want to go into um, the, the, the meat of this presentation. And um, if, you, if you go back to Monday morning in your week, this, this week, you will remember that you started with a lot of technical stuff, with the theory. In, in parallel, you did the workshops with the practical way of modeling. And altogether, this started with um, technical and theory. And this morning, you very clearly saw yesterday a little bit of regulatory. Uh, I heard that from uh, Francesco Papalago, for example. But Today, you heard from uh, Albert, uh, the real uh, change from research going into development. And really, what we're going to talk about today is development itself of the products, namely medical devices and drugs, which obviously are the more schematic ones. But you can imagine that if you want to be, to talk about innovative products, then you can call them generically health tech products, and you mix them all, including all the combination products, all the borderline products, all the impossible to classify products. Well, you have them all, and we'll call them health tech products, because the more, sorry, the more innovation, the more difficult to classify those products. Um, so um, let me also, uh, mention the, the famous initiative um, that was uh, created many years ago by the FDA, which was called the Critical Path. And to make a very long story sh short, the Critical Path at FDA was an initiative that simply uh, aimed at removing the obstacles on the way of product developers. That is, everything that was slowed down, everything that was difficult, that was uh, inefficient, that was a major difficulty, like climbing a huge mountain, on the path of the, the, the developers, had to be eliminated one way or another. So there were many, many solutions in a very, very diverse areas uh, of um, expertise that were created, of course. But certainly, this was the, the embryo of what is now um, the in silico clinical, well, in silico medicine 
because um, in silico is very, very ubiquitous in, in drug research and development from discovery to post-market. And this is what we're going to discuss today. Um, so basically, the, this critical path when you take the in silico solution means that, and this is our take home <coughs> message, means that in the past, you would go to submit a file to the FDA or to the EMA to get an authorization to market your product or to notify bodies for medical devices. But you would bring supportive information that was done on animal research, or on animal studies, and in humans only. Why is that? Because the agencies had this dogma that um, everything that would be modeling and simulation was predictive and therefore not true science. And that's what I heard for so many years, so many decades in my life. And, and here I was promoting and promoting in silico research, which by the way, I know nothing about in silico modeling and simulation myself, but I'm a big fan of it. And it's Cecile, who is our bridge between regulatory and market access into the technical stuff and, and therefore translating technical into language that can be understood by the agencies that ultimately make decisions. So basically, um, to go back to, to FDA, promoting this uh, in silico research was very hard for so many years. And suddenly, probably, there was an impulse from um, the economic side. You could, well, you, uh, um, companies could not keep spending billions of dollars developing uh, products and bringing them to the market 10 or 20 years after, and not to mention when they would fail, throwing everything away and starting all over again. So that was not sustainable. And th this is probably one among the reasons that pushed the in silico medicine at the forefront of drug drug and device, well, first of all, device and then drug development. And, and it's very important to understand that because now that the breach is not only open, but that um, it is promoted um, by the agencies, in particular by the FDA, we really have a chance to make it happen. And we have a chance to see one day a drug, devices, it's already done, but a drug presented uh, for a marketing authorization to the FDA, for example, with <clears throat> the clinical data that supports the evaluation of the risk-benefit ratio being supported by human data and in silico data. And that will be a major victory of in silico uh, over uh, the, the old dogmas. Um, let me take a minute to say that we are members of the Avicenna Alliance and, and um, Cecile and I are uh, leading the working group on policy development in which we have a number of task forces. And um, those task forces each represent one of the very important um, aspects of, um, of in use of in silico in order to accelerate and make things more efficient in um, Drug, develop, drug and device development. So on this slide that I have left on purpose for a long time here, uh, you can see uh, all, it, it is one that uh, was presented a little bit differently yesterday by uh, Francesco, but um, in two words, you know, it shows the different steps um, in the pre-market and post-market uh, life cycle of the development of drugs and devices. And um, really, um, this uh, um, shows the, the evolution of uh, the, the methods that we use to develop those products. In the past, you know, it was only uh, pure science. Now it's becoming, we have, for example, in, uh, in non-clinical, we have a lot of use of in vitro, 
um, cells and whatever cell culture. We have uh, many techniques also using in silico that allow you to extrapolate animal um, data to humans and therefore to predict, to model uh, a clinical study. But obviously the ultimate is really to demonstrate um, safety and most importantly efficacy of your drug or the performance of your device uh, using in, in silico models. And, and that, that is really the, the, the big progress that we made um, in the past few, few years, yes. Um, so what is in silico medicine bringing? It's simply bringing a revolution. And uh, we called it here a paradigm shift. Um, and the idea is really to ensure that safe, affordable, and cost-effective health tech products make it um, to, to the market through a large-scale adoption of the in silico medicine. And really, that's the, 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 the goal of the Avicenna Alliance, but it's also the goal of, um, of many um, product developers that really want um, to make it happen. So basically, um, we can divide this in, in three parts when you look at the, um, uh, the papers that are being published by one of the former FDA commissioners. Uh, who was extremely, uh, who was a champion of in silico um, medicine. Um, there's, first of all, a much more widespread in the use of modeling and simulation. Then there is also post-market a greater use of real data, real world evidence, real world data that can be used to support um, price and reimbursement, not to mention also clinical efficacy in some cases with clinical utility, cost effectiveness, and all the economic um, side of it. And um, also the adoption of tools um, so that uh, we have more real-time information after the product is approved. So the message here is really uh, the agencies, both regulatory and HTA bodies for price and reimbursement, are really uh, encouraging modeling and simulation, encouraging in silico medicine, as opposed to in the past. And um, I, I want to modulate this, um, and, and without any, uh, this is my own opinion, but I really think that EMA has the will to do it, but not enough resources on this, which slows them down a little bit. Whereas the FDA has really created a group of, um, well, it's uh, mainly the clinical pharmacology group from the past that was totally oriented and geared towards, in, um, towards IT and, and uh, modeling. So these guys, using their pharmacology background plus their quote-unquote geek side, then they became um, the, the MIDD, uh, Model Informed uh, Drug Development Group. And these guys are uh, sort of um, um, uh, 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 advisors to the review divisions, where when within the review divisions, you have two real separated groups, you have the heads of divisions that are totally in favor of in silico medicine and will push it, and cardiorenal is, by definition, the champion at FDA. On the contrary, you have others um, that I won't mention specifically, but that are totally against it. And Cecile will speak about um, this uh, skepticism because, of course, it's a mix of going forward and believing in it, and at the same time, some people uh, withdrawing from the effort and, and really going backwards all the time. So we're still in a transition period. So when I say that the agencies and HTA bodies are in favor, yes, it is true, but it's a theory. And you always have kind of old-fashioned people who want to stay behind and push back. But that's okay. That's always been the case everywhere, and we have to live with it. But the machine is progressing, and that's what's important. 
So now I'm going to let Cecile keep going with um, an explanation of this little curve that I showed before, uh, where uh, we compare medical devices and drugs development. Thank you. So like Emmanuel was saying, the, the, the paradigm shift is, is present now. And one of the key things to understand is that when you develop a product, a drug, a device, a combination, you have to accumulate scientific evidence. They could be from bench testing, in vitro testing, ex vivo testing. They could come from animal testing. Of course, you have the clinical testing on human, of course. But then the computational modeling is breaching everything, meaning that, well, the in vitro, the bench testing will feed to create the model, to verify it, to validate it. You can revalidate with clinical information. But what is important is that when you look at all this testing, the bench testing in vivo, in vitro, a human clinical trial, they are all models. They're actually models. A human clinical trial is just a model. You select your condition, your time point, your end point, your patient. They are not like go to the patient, you select them. So actually they are models. And now the mission that we have is to make, you know, every, all stakeholders understanding that in silico data are just digital evidence, a new type of evidence. But they are there, they are evidence. And the, the challenge that we have when we want to use this approach is to give, to build trust in those evidence. But back in the day when you had the molecular biology, like the PCR that everyone got a chance maybe to be exposed thanks to the COVID testing, um, back in the day nobody believed in the PCR. Why? Well, you have a bridge of nucleic acid, you can amplify it and know what it is. Prove it's true. Well, that's the same for in silico. It's just a new type of evidence, and you have to re not reinvent the wheel, but working. And what you can see on the bottom right of the screen, it's a prediction that Tina Morrison was uh, making in 2018, saying, well, originally, most of the data are coming from bench testing, animal testing, clinical trial. But she expects that in the very near future, half of those data will be in silico, will be digital evidence. And how do we accumulate them? You guys know that much better than Emmanuel and I. It's coming from a large spectrum of in silico technologies. You can go, for like uh, Francesco presented a few, you saw others in the beginning of the week. You have the more the computational modeling family, you have the more the AI family, but actually they are not independent. They can feed each other, they can cross paths, they can complete each other. You have the mechanistic approach, physiological approach, phenomenological approach. And all this kind of thing is great, but then imagine for regulators how you deal with that. It's not one type of evidence. You have to deal with so many that are actually feeding each other. It's becoming super complex. But you have some effort when you get to there, then you can have some progress. And one of the big uh, projects that also what was initiated with the collaboration of Dassault System and FDA, but since then a lot of academic labs, a lot of little labs, join the effort is the Living Heart Project. Was at first designed to help for the development of medical devices. And we know that now they are actually starting to investigate this model to look at cardiotoxic drugs. So we went like a step again behind just the sample simulation of her heart. Another example is what the ITS is doing, like having a whole body uh, twin and you can look at the muscle, the skeleton, everything. It's a great when you want to kind of predict what could be dosimetry, some biomedical application. But do you use it like super early on so it doesn't have any impact on patient or can you use it later on? That's all where the challenge is. So if we go back to the product development, so early stages, this is where you're gonna see that some of the in methods can maybe have more advantages than other. Concept in feasibility for drug. Well, before you had a, search, uh, a researcher, he was a scientist locking a library and trying to find a new candidate, looking at tons and tons of articles to try to find the one that doesn't exist. Well, now we have the AI, we have the machine learning. That will get much faster. And there is no risk for the patient. The point is to accelerate the discovery so you can find a candidate, you can find a target, you can find both, see how they mix match, and look at what is the medical need. What is the therapeutic, what, what is the therapeutic indication you want to 
treat and how you can make that fit. So these kind of in silico methods help to accelerate this system of looking at everything that is done in molecular biology, proteomics, all the omics, technically. For the device, before you had a guy in a quent of a lab and doing this little prototype with some plastic Legos or something like that, now you can design your prototype with a 3D. You can model it. You can actually model also the anatomy of the patient you might target, see if they match. Does, do you have like a proof of concept that's gonna fit the history of the product development? And you can look also what are the chemicals because you have this great device in mind and say, oh, I got this plastic thing. It's, it's great, it's modeling, I can make my great prototype. Well, if this plastic is super toxic and cancerogen, you might want to avoid to use it as raw material. So you can already start to screen that. And then when you got your idea, we're gonna switch to the non-clinical stage. That's the fun part. And you have a lot of work to do. So one of the favorite modeling system that uh, agency love because historically, that's the first one for which they got guidance. That's the first one, actually, that they feel comfortable with still now, uh, is the PBPK. So you actually do statistic prediction, but taking into account the different body compartments. So you're going to make statistics on what could happen in the liver, what could happen to the spleen, lymph node, and so on. And you can do that for the animal level. And then you can try to see for different ages, like an adult versus a juvenile or you can go between species, up to human. Those are models, they are statistically based models. But what you can do as well is to use modeling and simulation to choose an animal model when you have to do an animal testing. Not all the animals are equivalent. To the agencies, they will never tell you, oh, you're developing this kind of product, you should use the rat model because it's great. They will never tell you that. This is your responsibility to find in an ethical, scientifically rational that the animal model you choose because you have to is the most relevant one. That's the one that will provide you, taking into account the ethic, of course, taking into account the ethic, you're gonna have to say, well, this model is the one that helped me to answer this question. You guys are familiar with the context of use. When you create an animal model, when you can look at it, you have the context of use. An animal model will never be able to answer all the questions, just only one your context of use, question of interest. The question remains the same as you can see. And then of course you can look at the design, optimization of your design. That's what we aim for clinical, we can do it already in non-clinical and try to make sure that you select your time point, your end point, and you can use modeling for that. For the device, same thing, bench testing. You can do a lot of bench testing, modeling simulation. You guys are used to do that. Same thing, animal model selection. If you want to develop a stent, which animal breed species will we use? And for a species breed of anatomical difference, you might not be able to use any breed. One thing for now that will not be part of the in silico modeling for device is the biocompatibility. This one is regulated by a standard, the ISO 10993. It's really looking at the safety of the device and maybe in the near future, the modeling will help to assess part of this, but right now we have to follow the standard, which is really aiming to make sure that the device is safe. And we know historically that unfortunately, devices were developed more or less in the looking at the safety and we had huge problem. And this is why now the new European directive, the MDR has been like super reinforcing the fact that you need to establish your safety, you need to make some clinical trial for devices. That was not always the case. And uh, for that part, modeling simulation might not be used in the near future. And some other example. So in non-clinical, we use the 3R principle, which is reduce, that means you use less animal, if you can. Replace, if you can find an alternative method, go for it. And refine, that means that's the optimization I was telling you about. And the key thing is that modeling simulation can help for this three level. And what you can see on the right hand side is just a couple of examples of animal choice. You have two species, you need to work on a hard device, which one would you take? Well, the advantage is you already have the model of your device, you can see if they fit with the anatomy of the animal and choose the best model. That means you de-risk your non-clinical study. That means also you decrease the time, you decrease the cost, 
And ethically, you're much better because you're not trying, oh, I'll try the ship, doesn't work. Uh, I'm going to go for the big, uh, doesn't work. So I don't, it's science. You might still face issue, but it's still good to be able to de-risk that when you can. Same thing for identifying the worst case scenario, identifying the source of viability for your design and trying to maybe replace the control court. Sometimes control, when you do over and over the same study, you always have a control group. Like, I like this quote that says, nothing ruins better an experiment than a, a control group. Because without the control, you cannot assess anything. But then, do you have to repeat your control group every time? Maybe modeling simulation can help to do a true group control and then reuse it. And by the way, the autonomy is part of the Avencina as well. And then, well, we are talking about testing a product here. But you need to manufacture it. So like Albert mentioned, you have an idea. It could be a prototype. It could be just a little molecule that you set up in your lab. But then what do you do? Well, manufacturing and the quality assessment of what you manufacture is going to evolve during the whole development of your product. And you're going to come from, hey, I got my molecule. That's great. Well, you can have the best molecule ever. And it can cure everything if you cannot formulate it in a stable and reliable manner if it's not snapped with the formulation or with the concept. And if you cannot, in addition, control it and administer it to the patient, then it's useless. So this is what everything is done, what we call, uh, in the jargon, CMC or manufacturing, so chemically, uh, chemistry manufacturing quality, is that you need to be able to product safely um, a product and make sure you evolve it. But then you have a problem of scaling, too. It's easy to prepare, like, maybe 10 nanogram of a molecule, maybe a tiny prototype of your bench, but you're not treating one patient. You want to treat all the patients. So what about the scaling? What about the administration? What's going to be efficacious? Well, this is where a digital twin form process can come into the picture, and in cynical modeling approach can also be used for that. So if you want to change the porosity of the tab that you're going to give to the patient because you realize that if you change it, well, maybe the adsorption will be more efficacious and the effect on the patient will be faster. You have also the coating. And then if you can look on the right, left-hand side, you have a reactor. And that's great. You have all your pills spinning and everything. When do you do your quality control? At one point, will you select that, make sure that when you have your pills spinning into the reactor, it's actually all identical. At what time will we do the, the in-process control? Another example, you have everything is set up, your product is on the market, everything is great, and you have a batch that fell, and another batch that fell. You need to know why. But you cannot always reproduce everything, say, OK, my batch fell, so I'm going to reproduce the lot, and you cannot find it. Well, modeling and simulation can help you for that. That means you're going to try to do your root cause analysis using a modeling approach. And that is really, look, I mean, the agency is starting to really be interested in this kind of approach. And they are encouraging that as well. And of course, the scaling. Again, produce it a tiny beaker. You have a huge reactor. Is it the same? Do you react the same? Not necessarily. And then now we talk a lot about 3D printing. It's great. And with a lot of devices are produced like that. Same thing. You can prepare your prototype using modeling. You can also do a root cause analysis if your 3D printing fail using this modeling approach. And technically, you can twin everything as soon as you have the right parameters. So the thing is, being, since the digital twin in the really stretch of the definition is the virtual representation of anything, it could be a representation of your process. And then that will help, like I said, increasing your quality. You can really look at all your parameters involved in the manufacturing. And a, a, a tiny thing that could really impact your safety, you produce a device, everything is set up, you have your manufacturing set. And then for some reason, you have to change one of the machines that will help to finish your device. Well, this machine might have some leachable that will contaminate chemically or biochemically your device. Your device is not safe anymore, and you might have failing for the safety control. So again, having make sure that you take into account your process, and if you change one parameter, you can evol evaluate it before really in, you know, investing in this new system. That will help. 
And the key thing is that you can speed up also your scale up. This is one of the biggest challenge when you look at manufacturing. It's easy to do it on a bench. It's easy to do a semi-pilot, but when you have the big pilot and then you need to produce and, oh, by the way, I want to sell in several countries. They don't have all the same rules. Well, how you do your scale up? Do you have the accelerant plant? Do you have only one plant and you export everything? Again, simulations can really be helpful for that. And now the clinical stages. So this is great. You got your product. You succeed to manufacture it. It's safe and it's great. Uh, well, you're not in your final product yet. You should be, if you can. Ideally, your product, when you go to clinical stage, should be representative of the product you will go on the market, which take into account is manufacturing steps, the in-process control, the sterilization, if you need to, the method, and the packaging. Packaging could be a source of contamination that can affect the safety of your product. So ideally, the product you will go into clinical stage will be Manufacture, control, package the same way that you will do when the product will be on the market. That's the ideal world. We know it's not always the same thing. Trying to, you have to adapt. But then modeling and simulation can help you again for your clinical design. Like I mentioned for non-clinical, the principle is the same. You can select your patient. You can optimize the design. And here we are, we, I mentioned a lot ethic when I was talking about non-clinical. We know it's always you know, difficult to take the decision to test on animal. Imagine on human. Yeah, well, I want my stent. It's great. I'm going to try a few patients. If they die, eh, I will have my statistic. Not really working. So you need to make sure that you can de-risk your design. You can de-risk your endpoint. And there is nothing that can make fail a clinical trial at the wrong endpoint. And one example that I recall from uh, one FDA conference I attended to was amazing. These people were developing a drug to cure lupus. Lupus is a very uh, enabling disease. And they were trying the real-time recording with device and trying to have the classical approach. And as classical approach, they say, well, when people feel better, they walk. So let's see as the count of steps per day as endpoint. And then they had one particular patient. They say, OK, this one is not reacting to the treatment at all. She has zero step per day. It's even worse than before. And actually, they went to the real-time monitoring that they were experimenting. Well, this lady was a pianist. The drug worked so well on her that she could play piano again. So of course, she stopped working because she spent days on the piano. And actually, she was the best responder of the whole cohort they had tested. And I like this example because you can totally fail a clinical trial if you don't have the right endpoint. And modeling and simulation can help you to identify them and to test them. So of course, you cannot predict that the Patient you will enroll will be a pianist. They will want to play piano, not exaggerating. But talking with patient association, involving them in the development is going to be key. And even if you do modeling and simulation, even more if you do that, a developer should really discuss with patient association, engage with them, involve them, because they will tell you what the device, like Albert mentioned, do you want to wear a helmet or you want to die because you don't like the helmet for 10 years? Talk to them, engage them. And actually, agencies now are really encouraging and sometimes actually put patient association representative into the meetings for the sponsor to engage with them. The expert of the disease is actually the patient, not the clinician. They have to live with it. So it will be the patient or the family, but they are the one to deal with it every day. They know the pains, they know the you know, the enabling situation. And involved in even for your modeling and simulation, what parameter will you use to define your virtual court? Which parameter will you use to make sure that your virtual patient are actually a representative from the patient you are targeting? That's really key. And it's really to bear in mind. And then even if we look at medical devices, well, it's kind of easier somehow because you have, let's say, a hip prosthesis. Well, it's mechanic. You have an elasticity module. You have a breaking point. Doesn't mean you should not engage with patient. But the advantage is this kind of thing, like imaging devices, you may maybe in the very near future actually not do patient testing anymore. And that's a big advantage for a device that is few steps ahead from the drug because you're dealing with mechanic. And that's why also they were the first one to go into the in silico mode because testing a hip prosthesis, testing a car, eh. Same thing, just mechanic and physics. But after you have to deal with the patient and you have to deal with the endpoint again, optimization. So always having action in there. 
and this is where a concept came into the picture. Emmanuel started to mention it. Um, the first baby step were the model informed drug development, because this is where FDA started a pilot program to, for any sponsor that want to add an in silico component to their development to see what in silico component, how they can engage with the agency to see how do you create your model, how will you verify, validate, assess the credibility, estimate and quantify the uncertainties linked to your model. That's also key and I will come back on that in a minute. But now you can say that it's also evolving and like Tina Morrison mentioned at the in silico UK workshop not a while ago, we can talk about product inform, model informed product development because it works also for device. So sure, you have the formal MIDD program that was set at FDA. The model informed drug development is also mentioned in different countries like Japan, South Korea, China, not as the same status than the FDA one, but still it exists. But model actually can inform a device development, so why not using product development? And why do you use that? Well, thanks to the model, you can look at the dose response exposure. You can try to see the dosing regimen. How many, if you want to de-risk a clinical trial for a drug that you need to administer several times, well, maybe with the clinical data that you acquire from phase one, phase two, and the non-clinical, you can maybe say, maybe it's better if I do that twice a week, or maybe it's once a week. And the dosing regimen and the how you will administer the product is always very difficult. For device, if you take a long plant, long term implant, great, you in term long term. What means long term? Five years, 10 years? How do you know that? So same thing, you can start to kind of envisage what will happen to your device thanks to your modeling. Of course, you're gonna need data, a lot of data and high quality data to validate your model to make sure that what you're predicting is accurate. And that's one of the concerns of the agencies and notify body right now. Do you have qu high quality data to prepare your model, verify, validate, and so on? That's the key. And that's why also European Commission making an effort to discuss about the possibility of sharing data with the health data space. That's, we have tons of data generated every day. How many percentage of we use? Don't know, really nothing, almost. And it's really important to be able to use those data, the real data, and after you will take the in silico approach that fit the best what you can predict. From one of the publications that FDA mentioned for when it was still a pilot, and a lot of sponsors are really happy, it was now confirmed as a true program that's gonna remain as interaction with the FDA. For the MIDD, how was it used when they saw sponsors coming to them? Well, the first one was dose optimization. We don't want to try several doses on patient and see which one will work. You did risk that with the modeling. Same thing for the clinical trial optimization, the end point. When do you measure what? Important, you can simulate that if your virtual cohort is really representative for your patient. So the question to bear in mind is, are my virtual patient representative of my virtual patient, um, real patient population? We're not talking, you can do personalized medicine, with one patient, and we mentioned that a few days ago, but then what about the population? So this is where modeling simulation can have a role, either personalized or for a population. Everything will depend how the model is built, your context of use, question of interest. And the last thing is really supportive evidence for efficacy. And you have two ways to do that. One way is you want to minimize the number of patients to be enrolled in your clinical trial. To different reason. You're looking at the orphan disease, rare disease. Your clinical trial can take forever to enroll the right number of patients to demonstrate statistically that your treatment is good because it's a rare disease. So you don't have many patients. So complementing your real patient with virtual patient can help to demonstrate the statistic uh, relevance of your treatment. The other point too, COVID was a good example. A lot of clinical trials were ongoing during the COVID crisis. A lot of patients couldn't go for the checkup. A lot of data points were missing. So some sponsors succeed to kind of reach some of them by having questionnaire. But if you need an imaging, an MRI, well, you can ask the patient to do the MRI at home. That's not going to work. 
So actually, modeling simulation can also help to complement the missing point and see if, despite the missing point, what you observe for your real patient is still accurate. And I mentioned the three R principle for non-clinical. It's even more important for clinical, don't you think? You want to reduce the number of patients for different reasons. First of all, because it's more ethic. You don't want to have patients say, hey, you're going to get something. We don't know what. Good luck. Not really great, especially if you're the patient. Uh, you want to refine. You want to make sure that your clinical design is really accurate and ensure the safety of the patient, which is the main concern of any agency, and it should be the concern of everything. Um, and you want to have the right endpoint, the right timing. And you want to replace, if you can, again, the example of some imaging system, imaging device, you can maybe replace a real clinical trial by an in silico one. And this is just a, a few examples of how in silico can be used in the framework of work of in silico trial. You can look at the QSAR uh, relationship and predict human risk. It's really looking at the relationship between molecules, chemistry, and toxicity. Uh, you can try to predict safety and efficacy by modeling from, like Francesco was showing, like for the human system uh, simulator. So you go from the molecule up to the organ, to the whole body, and see how it works. You can also use for scaling and scrapulating, especially when you look at uh, different population age, um, you have to work with adults, you have to work with elderly, you have to work with pediatric. It's not the same game, even in non-clinical, so when clinical and non-clinical can rely on that, it helps, but modeling can also help to bridge them. Your virtual physiological patient, I mentioned that. And your simulation, what are the best responders? So here you can actually be on the verge of saying, well, I look at the right best responder. So it's just an inclusion criteria, or am I moving forward the companion diagnostic? So companion diagnostic is a term used for a device that will help to find the best responder for a drug, and it's usually used in oncology application. But why not looking at other application? And silico can have a position here. And of course, building the tool. And like I'm sure you heard that so many times this week, and during all your, your classes, but verification, validation. This is the only way to build trust in the model, like the whole methods had to do it before, and quantify uncertainties. You have to make assumptions for your models. You have to make assumptions to choose your equation and how you will model. You need to assume that. So when you take a classical protein assay, biochemistry, well, you know that you have a certain uncertainty for your pipetting. You have a certain uncertainty on the reading of your spectrophotometer. And you build that. And you will say, oh, well, we don't take that into account. No, because it was done like back in the days. And we know that. And it's incorporated in the way we analyze those data. Modeling simulation is new. You have to do the same thing. The, the, it's exactly the same road. Just the way you do it is slightly different. One very nice example is the Victor trial that FDA run. Uh, just to show that actually digital evidence can be considered as true scientific evidence to support a device assessment. And it was for an imaging system. So it's one of the first that went there. Uh, nobody, you know, blocked you to go for the next one. But it's very important to see that this kind of study is really putting the first step as replacing the human trial by virtual trial. In model informed product development, here you come again. What about after you market it? So when a drug, a device, a combination is on the market, we have what we call the surveillance, the vigilance it could be. That means looking at what happened to the patient that received your, your product when it's on the market. So you're going to hear back and you can say you might have heard some time, oh, this product was recalled, there were an issue, or like, some patients have side effects. Well, what about if you can predict them? Two advantages. First of all, you can refine the way you're going to make your vigilance, not hoping for random thing, but maybe say, who I know that my stents start to have issue based on my model after five years. Maybe uh, we may, we're going to put a control point to the patient that receive it in five years, just to be safe of it and to avoid kind of issues. But most importantly, what about the payers? Because yeah, 
we just tell you the high story, you develop your product, everything's fine, it goes on the market, who's gonna buy it? Who's gonna pay for it? They are the HTAs and they are the payers. Different language depending on the country, but that's the same thing. So why would they reimburse your product compared to the others? Because they trust it. Because they know that if they pay for that product, the patient's gonna be safe for many years. And that's worth the investment. So having a model informed development, helping to assess what could happen to your product 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that means you're not waiting to hear back from the field. You can actually start to predict. And of course, you're gonna need to be validated against your phase three trial, for example. But that's really a huge potential that's here. And if you look at HTAs, they actually publish some information like for medical devices and say, hey, we are lacking information to trust the device long term. So what about using modeling and simulation? And this is where it's, you really have a potential here is to straighten the scientific evidence you collected to date and predict what could happen after. And you have also the fact that in some cases, well, you cannot maybe have the experiment that supports your, your claim, but you, any claim needs to be supported, so why not using digital evidence? You need to have the long-term evaluation, and like I mentioned, the vigilance criteria. So the more people will have confidence in your product, regulators will say, hey, that's great. Well, now we can see how your product will evolve. The payers too, all the stars align. Well, you need to explain to them how you use those evidence because it's ready in saying like that, but how do you use them? So, so far, regulatory framework is really building as we speak. Can I saw that slowly? Uh, one of the first, uh, I would say, breaking standards was the ASME VNV40 that uh, look into was meant for medical devices. Look at the credibility, assess the credibility of your model. Now, in the pharmacology field, people are starting to use it and try to document how they use something developed for devices, but actually can apply to pharmaceutical in certain limits, and they have to explain why. And then the FDA published also two guidance uh, to explain how you report data. Because what I didn't mention yet is that any communication tool with agencies or competent authorities are reports. If you don't have a nice experimental report for due diligence to get investors, to discuss with competent authorities, then what is not written doesn't exist. It's a quality saying, but that's what happened for them. So you need reports. And how do you report a simulation? And this guidance is pretty useful for that. And that's the packaging. And that's the translation Emmanuel mentioned above. Is, oh, I'm talking about my validation. My model is validated. Like Francesco was saying yesterday, you validate for your model. Did you clinically validate it? Not the same thing, same word. So you need to be very specific in the way you communicate. And one thing when we were discussing with the agencies is that they cannot find a definition that will fit everybody, but they encourage any sponsor that will make a report to start with a glossary. Well, in this document, I will call validation this. I will call clinical validation this. And you define what seems obvious to you, might not be obvious for the reviewer. And have early interaction with the agencies. You have many pathways. Uh, Francesco mentioned qualification yesterday. You have also the MIDD, like I mentioned. You have pre-IND for the FDA. You have scientific advice, innovation task force in DMA. The agencies are really eager to see these kind of things when you have breakthrough technology, breakthrough approach. So talking to them early on, it's really encouraging. You need to talk to them. You need to say, hey, I'm coming with this great idea. And, well, I'm gonna go that path. And they tell you, well, that sounds interesting. We believe it, or no, just forget it. You will never have a go. And like Emmanuel said, it depends who you talk to. It depends on the division, depends on your integration. There is a lot of variable factor. That said, if you have a good interaction with the agency, that's a very good argument to get investors. Say, hey, I talked to the agency, they are super interested. Oh, so maybe it's worth to invest in your project. But it's not like a fairy tale, so we have the skepticism. The key thing is, like I said, high quality data. How do you get them? Are you able to segregate them? That's a question that we see often from the agency. Okay, that's great, you did the model, you did the simulation. Did you use the same data or did you segregate them? How did you? Is it documented? If it's not documented, you didn't do it. 
So you have to bear that in mind when you do modeling and simulation. It's like for any other studies, other study experiments, you need to make sure that you document properly. And it's a play for a lot of academic labs that want to do spin-off because they come to us and say, hey, we have this great idea, and say, yeah, do you have reports? Uh, PowerPoint doesn't count. <laughs> so this is where it's, it's a part of the learning curve, but that's very important. And then, of course, one thing that is going to be discussed this afternoon, uh, an effort that is meant by uh, Avecina Alliance, VPH Institute, and this is word with uh, Luca, <coughs> Emily, and uh, Marco Vicicanti, and all the task force from the Alliance is the good simulation practice. For non-clinical, you have to comply with the good laboratory practice as soon as it's related to safety. When you're still in discovery phase, that's fine. But when it's safety, you need good laboratory practice. What does it mean? You build trust in your data. The good laboratory practice, the good manufacturing practice, or the good clinical practice are just very fancy words to say, I know exactly what I'm showing you. I have a trustability from the moment my product left the factory till the patient and the data I'm showing you. I have a traceability from the raw material I purchase to my product. And actually, I can show you the whole journey from the raw molecule to the data I got from the patient. And it's building trust. And for modeling and simulation, the good simulation practice is the way to go. You need to build that trust. You need to give confidence. And you need to be able to demonstrate that everything you've done is actually matching, traceable, repeatable, and that your data are reliable in a shot. And you need, and you have another hurdle facing, it's like we mentioned with Emmanuel, <coughs> Francesco mentioned it as well. Well, agencies are encouraging us, that's great. Well, there is a little issue here, is the lack of experience. And this is where BPH has a role, for example, to be a third party expert for agencies or competent authorities like Notify Body, because Regulators are not all up to speed on modeling simulation. Payers, investors, public, patient. That means, well, of course the patient will not do the model, but you need to be able to explain to them how it's gonna go, how it's gonna work, how do you validate. And not using fancy words, so this is where translation is gonna matter, because you're gonna have to take in lay term what was super geeky and scientific and super great when you did your report with your pair that the other won't understand. And the harmonization. The in silico journey is a stakeholder adventure. It cannot be one person, one lab. It's everyone doing that that needs to work together. That's the only way. And this is why you have this joint effort between nonprofit organizations like Avecina, VPH, in silico world that work hand by hand with FDA, EMA, and other competent authorities to make this happen. Because we don't want it to happen in 100 years from now. Everything is going fast, and we know we can go faster. We just need to work together. And some efforts are made. So more and more in the FDA communication, EMA communication, you're going to see bits in there. Hey, use in silico. Use modeling. Trust me, 40 pages, one word, super promising. But it's getting there. And when you have public consultation, this is where stakeholders can participate and say, you mentioned modeling and simulation, but do you agree to use it for that, that, that? And public consultation are a great opportunity to interact. But through the agencies and to the association, we want to also, also to be a few steps ahead and not wait for consultation, but more proposing what they could put in the guidance. So long story short, as you can see, product development, easy busy, nothing to worry about. In silico can actually play a role at any stage, any steps. One thing to bear in mind is that your in silico approach will not have the same impact, not impact factor, but impact on patient, meaning impact on competent authority decision, depending on the stage. You use modeling simulation, AI, machine learning, early stage, when you're trying to develop a candidate, it's fine. No impact on the patient, you will go to the classic road. The get closer you get from the patient, the stronger will have to be your verification. The stronger is gonna be your validation, credibility assessment, and uncertainty, quantification uncertainties because it's gonna be key. The closer you are the patient, the higher is the risk for the patient, the higher is the concern from the agencies. And that makes sense. So in a nutshell, you need high quality data. That's really everything that you need. And it's really important and it's really hard to get. So when you work with 
people that do the classical thing and will give you the data, ask them for real report, making sure that they validate themselves, done non-clinical, in vitro, in vivo, and everything. When you do that to the lab, make sure that your data are reliable. Verify them, validate, validate, validate. I cannot say that better, and I'm sure that you heard that every day. And to advocate for the adoption of in silico medicine, high quality model, high quality reports. And that's really where it's, everyone is annoyed by that, but it's actually so crucial. And the good simulation practice, of course. That's the only way to build trust in what we are doing. And that's the only way to build trust in in SICO approach. Thank you. Thanks very much for the fantastic talk, Cecilia and Manuel. Uh, so are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a few. So uh, what is your opinion about black box models or black box machine learning algorithms? Uh, so my opinion really don't matter. <laughs> uh, but for the agency, <laughs> no, that's true. I'm not a regulator. I just know that usually that's the first question they ask. Because black box is what is in the box. Is your cat alive or not? So that's the thing. Can you track? Can you trust? Can you show that everything that happened in the black box is actually reliable? That's the key thing. So black box, I don't say it's not happening. It's going to be more difficult to convince regulators that what is happening in your black box is really happening and can be reproducible and repeatable. So if you have statistic demonstration that say, hey, when I do the experiment 15,000 times, I got the same result, that might go through. But it, it gives you more hurdle, more challenges, more difficulty to convince a regulator. And, and it's true that in, in reality, when we go to see FDA, or we went before COVID, but to see the FDA, they, they say, OK, give me a platform, and we will use it ourselves to make sure that the data you're obtaining, we can repeat it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So. OK, thank you. Um, my question is more related to a practical concept, because, I mean, Obviously, in silico medicine is is emerging and, and 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 it's really important and it's going to be implemented. But how? I mean, nowadays it's like we have more knowledge, we are able to build more complex models, and obviously all these simulations and all this kind of pipeline is like a lot of time and. Sometimes when people just tell you, oh, yeah, I have a really cool simulation that is like a two days simulation. And maybe, I mean, a doctor is not going to, to tell you that this is useful because in the, clinical, in the clinical practice, this is not really much useful. So how can we deal with that and how can we deal with data also? Because this is the another ethical concern like, how can we get data from a hospital and how can I use it? Because maybe I cannot get the data outside the hospital. Uh, that's two very good questions. The first one I would say you answer yourself. The doctor might think it's not useful. Why? Because it's your question of use and your context of, of, uh, context of use a question of interest. What is your simulation aiming for? So if your simulation is aiming to help for a diagnostic, of course, and to help for decision making at a crucial point, that means your simulation needs to be fit to that. And that's really important. But if you just to take a decision not in emergency setting, for example, two days might be acceptable. So it's really depending what your simulation is aimed for. Again, we go back to the context of use. And that's really important because you have some system that say, hey, the patient will go surgery, what do we do? Well, that means your simulation needs to be as fast as the imaging you can acquire during the, the first assessment of the patient. If the patient needs to do MRI, well, you know, your simulation needs to fit that. And I will use, and I know I mean I was smiling, but that means when you develop a product that has such a clinical application, you need to start with what we call a target product profile, which is a driving document to drive a product development where you're going to define, okay, I want to target that indication, this patient, this is what my product, which is my simulation system, will be meant for. What are my constraints? Well, I need the doctor to be able to take a decision in less than one hour 
and you're gonna have to develop your model accordingly. And this is where it fits. But if it's just, you know, it's part of the regular exam and one week is sufficient, that's great. If I compare another example, histopathology, for example, you have the rush histopathology for cancer, for example. Those histopathology processes are meant in a way that they can have the answer in a few hours. But if you go for regular testing, it will take 48, 72 hours. And the processes have been adapted to that. So when you want to have a very thin, narrow investigation with using uh, antibody screening, immunohistochemistry, you go for the long path, and the tissue is very well preserved. However, if you go for a rush, you do not care about the tiny detail within the cell. You want to have the overall view, and it's a rush process. So those processes have been adapted. Simulation has to do the same. And in regards to data, GDPR, the um, HIPAA in US, uh, they put some constraints. You have some anonymization system, and this is one of the concerns of the European Commission that they want to create this and it's still like, I know the unicorn, but they want to have this data space sharing where all the data are accumulated are great. Now you have some uh, companies that help you to anonymize data, to have discussion with hospital. Uh, it's a question of partnership as well. Uh, and uh, yes, you have to respect the anonymization of the patient, but you need enough information because if I tell you one milligram glucose, Great, and so that was before, after drinking, after a meal, before, diabetic, not diabetic, young, old, you don't know. So they need to be anonymized to preserve the, the private life of the patient, but you need enough information. And this is where the challenge is right now, because you have some data, but you don't know the context. You don't know, sometimes you know the age, if you're lucky, the weight of the patient, but you don't have the whole biological background, you don't have his medical background, sometimes you don't even have the medical history, and that could be an issue to analyze the data and to put that in your model. But a lot is based on partnership with the clinician, with the hospital, and of course respecting the GDPR and HIPAA. Just to comment on that, on the data, especially if I think if we speak about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning based models that are mostly black box because of the mathematical yep. formalism that, has, that has, been, has been used for a specific model. Uh, data are actually, data used for training are part of the model. Yeah. So actually I think what you've just explained also relates somehow to the validation of the data set because the data set is, is, is completely part uh, of the model. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also why also you need to be able to demonstrate how you use your data, how you create your group, how you segregate them or not, and how you use them. And that's what the agency wants to know at the end, is to make sure that you're in control of your doing. So I know science is luck somehow, uh, but when you reach a patient, the closer you get to the patient, the more you need to be in control of what you're doing. And black box happen, but again, it depends on what stage of development you are, and the closer you get to the patient, the more it's going to be challenged by the agencies. I, I just wanted to add to the question that the, the guy up here asked uh, about black box models. As far as the regulator is concerned, or, or, or just if you follow the direction of travel, it becomes a data-centric conversation. You know, a black box is a black box. You know, we have lots of black boxes in the world today. You know, a, a car engine is a black box. You know, a jet engine is a black box, but we trust them. You know, eventually, algorithms will become very narrow in terms of their use. You know, at the moment, it's an open source world. There's millions of them. Everybody's playing that game. But eventually, you know, they'll be, they'll be trusted algorithms. They'll be certified algorithms. A lot of them will go behind the curtain as well. At the moment, they're very open and very available. But eventually, you know, they will go behind some, you know, uh, corporate... Well, as somebody who spends a lot of time validating black box models, I'm going to disagree with you slightly. Uh, you've got to balance that ethical conversation between you, you not using an algorithm, which is potentially more reliable than a clinician. If, you're, if you think about it, a lot of clinical decisions are correlation-based. 
They're not causation. For instance, psychiatry. The whole world of psychiatry is correlation. There's, there's no, there's, at, at this moment in time, you know, if you listen to guys like Carl Dieseroth, Carl Dieseroth will tell you that psychiatry can eventually reach that causational space. But at the moment, psychiatry is all correlation. So we're not stopping psychiatry until we get causational models. You know, so it becomes a very data-centric conversation and what the regulators want to see, and, and this builds on what Cecile was saying, does your data represent, first of all, your intended use? You know, what's the execution space that the model is going into? And, it, and in primar most importantly, does it represent the context of use? You know, so, you know, you can have a, you can have a, a, a fraud detection uh, algorithm, you know, but you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't take that necessarily into judging clinicians, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? So it's just, it's just that first question is, you know, have you got that data set up? And then it becomes a data quality conversation, a data integrity conversation, a pipeline integrity conversation. Because one thing we know with real processes and real systems is a lot of the validation, we, we set up perfect conditions. Mm. To, to talk about what Cecile was saying there, you know, a clinical trial is a perfect model. You know, we, mm. do, we get everything the way we want it. But the real world, once we do that clinical trial, the real world doesn't operate in perfection. So that's, what that's why you have to monitor black box models in a way that you don't have to mod monitor physics-based models because you know that they're grounded in causality and they're grounded in you know, well-recognized you know, uh, laws and theories and, 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 and uh, mathematics. So you know, we, we, we release products every day in industry based on final test results and process test results. Those are all data. We don't we don't test them on a person every day. <laughs> so you know, it, it's it's just the perception of all of the decision making or the majority of the decision making becoming digital and becoming. You know, at the moment we we we, we have our hands on the model, but eventually somebody will say whether it's you know an economic reason in the U.S. Maybe it's a litigious reason in the U.S. But in the US, you might find that there's insurance companies who say, we don't want a human being making those decisions anymore because the failure rate is 1%. We want a model to make those decisions because we are paying out too much money for you know, negligence. So you know, it's ethical, we'll get onto it later this afternoon, but there's always two sides to an ethical conversation. You know, yes, there's a risk to introducing a model, but there's also that ethical consideration that you're withholding a potential breakthrough medical offering. offering. Yeah, and we're also at the beginning of the story. And like you mentioned, the, the more we will know, the more you will have good practices set up, the easier we'll get to the, the system like going into routine. And that's all the point. But when you're at the beginning of the story, you have to make more effort to make people believe of what you're saying is true. It's always the same thing. It's all about frameworks, and we'll get onto that later. I mean, if you're if you're an early stage innovator, you want an open field, right? You don't want any rules to begin with, but you you need to know that eventually you're going to be, you know, when you learn to play football or any other sport, you know, you don't worry about the the lines on the pitch. You don't worry where the goals are. You just learn to control a ball and kick it. But eventually, you know, you have a referee, you have a whistle, <laughs> you know. There's it's there's time it's time limited, so. You know, you just have to kind of eventually, you know, marry those two things together. Okay, thank you. Any any other questions from the audience? Ah, yes, please. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I was wondering. You said that we are at the beginning of the of this journey in which we are transitioning from, uh, let's say, everything that is transitionable to in silico and in terms of time frames will this journey will take a lot of time for uh, this transition according to to your, to your opinion uh, if you can comment on, on this well, <clears throat> I can start with uh, my 30 years of <laughs> Um, experience trying to make the, the, the to break the dogma, the old dogma, and, and to make this acceptable. 
Now, by the time the industry and, and most importantly the physicians themselves uh, accept it, it's going to take, should I say decades? Hopefully shorter. Shorter. Okay, I don't want to be pessimistic. But, you know, <laughs> Cecile and I gave a talk the other day at a Paris hospital, um, and these guys were cardiologists, and they were about eight of them. And, and most of them, except for one, in fact, so seven, they, they were really telling us, this is totally crazy, this won't go anywhere. So we were like, it's tomorrow that you're going to see it happen. But for them, it was like a story. It's we science fiction. Science fiction. So when you see that skepticism, you wonder if it's going to take years or decades. Yeah, and this, this is why, like I was mentioning, is that it's not like one person effort. The fact that you have all the stakeholders getting together, that the agency are open to work together is because they see the need. Patient I need, we need treatment faster in a safely manner. So that's where we are all hopeful of, otherwise we won't be there. Uh, that it, it gets shorter because it's not like one technology going forward with one group. It's everyone is getting into the party. And this is what we hope, like decreasing the time. But if you talk to Tina Morrison, which was like the head of in silico at the FDA for a long time, uh, she was kind of, I have to convince my own colleagues, so how do you want me to move forward with the other, you know, the people from the industry? So even when we say FDA is forward, yeah, for some division, not all of the time, like Emmanuel was saying, some of them are still, yeah, you guys, yeah, play, play geek on your thing, while some division will say, we are geek, we believe in it, and it's going to work. So it's, uh, it's really a group effort, so hopefully short. <laughs> Thank, and, and one way of going through is the venture capitalists that uh, um, Albert was mentioning this morning. Why? Because these guys are dictating the rules of startups when they, when they develop their products because they have milestones to give them funding. And if instead of, for example, telling them, when you put your first patient in, we will give you this amount of money, they would say, once you've done your modeling and simulation for this, this, and that, we'll give you this amount of money, then it would pressure the startups to do it. And of course, it would make the ball running. Yeah, and I would just add one last point, is that the first combination product has been approved by the FDA with in silico uh, evidence was actually thanks to the push of the patient association was a diabetic system to inject insulin. That's the historical <coughs> one. And why? Because they didn't have enough evidence and patient association said, come on guys, it's working, like find something else. And then they consider digital evidence. So involving patient early on with this kind of approach is gonna be key to change the mindset. Okay, so it's a, uh, the collaboration, it's very important to the transition to, to the in silico. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I guess we we will move to coffee, but first of all, we would like to thank again Cecilia and Emmanuel for their talk. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.